doing, Parts? Yeah. Last week of the Insta Theology series that we're in the middle of, and uh, let me just tell you, man, the internet is not reliable. You just can't trust it, as is evidenced by the fact that we're joining all our Parts locations a little late tonight. So we apologize. There's been some technical stuff. That's why we, you know, did a little more worship here in the Dallas uh, area and kind of drug ourselves through the announcements. And JD, if you weren't here, all these other locations gave himself a dating shout out, which was totally out of bounds, but he did it anyway. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, man, it's great to finally be hooked up with you guys and all the other campuses. And we're going to talk about how to hook you up with some truth tonight. That's what we're doing. We're, we're, we love that we're diving in together. We've been talking about into theology, these little phrases, these, these slogans that are thrown at us that can inform us in so many ways. And tonight, we're going to be talking about the phrase, kind of follow your dreams, right? Follow your heart, follow your passions. You got to go for it, right? Live your life. You do you. There's a thousand ways to say it, but what we're going to talk about tonight is this is really wisdom in there. Should we follow our heart? Should we follow our genes? Should we trace what seems right to us? Well, let me just start with just a few of these little uh, posts that are out there. You've seen them, right? But just, here's a few that you're gonna run into when you go along the way, man. Follow your dreams, right? And the universe will open for you where there previously were only walls. Man, you gotta read that and you're like, yes. That's what I'm saying right there. I'm down with that, okay? Or how about this one? Follow your dreams. They know the way. Does that make sense, right? How about this? Hey, sometimes... Sometimes life is about risking everything for a dream no one can see but you, right? Now you're sitting there, you're scrolling through your phone, you're like, yes, yes, I believe that. I'm down with that. The biggest, this is Oprah, Oprah's going to chime in, the biggest adventure you can take is to live the life of your dreams. See, Oprah is on Instagram, okay? And so she apparently saw those other posts and she's laying it on you. It's Oprah now, so it's not just some random post out there. That's Oprah, Walt Disney. If you can dream it, you can do it. Tinkerbell, come on, you can do it. Just <laughs> flap those little fairy wings and we're gonna go somewhere. How about this one, Barbara Scherer? She says, as soon as you begin to pursue a dream, your life wakes up and everything has meaning. I mean, that's just like, yes. Say that to me again, give it to me. Steve Jobs, okay, let's come to the practical, come to the reality. Have the courage to follow your heart. Steve Jobs famously, in a way that impacted a generation when he was at Stanford, kind of gave a, a message and he just talked about, I mean, you find a job that you love. He didn't finish it with a phrase, you'll never work a day in your life, but that's what he was implying right there. He just told them, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. Then somehow know, they, you know, your dreams, your intuition, somehow it knows, he says, what you truly want to become. And I don't know, is that true? How about this one? You know, this guy followed his dreams. Yesterday I really wanted tacos and now I'm eating tacos. Follow your dreams. Oh, now that one, okay, that one I'm going to endorse right there, okay? <laughs> Dream about tacos and have yourself a taco. That one will work. Everything else, though, might need a little help. Listen, some of those ideas, you know, they are a bit inspiring. They might get you, you know, wondering a little bit to where you get out of your just kind of little workaday world or just kind of believe that all I can be is all anybody's ever told me. And what I want to share with you tonight is you don't need instant theology. And you need real theology. There's a real God, and he's really there, and he really loves you, and he's not looking to rip you off. He is looking to set you free. This God loves you so much that he came to rescue you from a way that seems right to you, but in the end, it leads to death. Those are his words, not mine. He wants to rescue you from having to learn through experiencing, from having to kind of make your way through the dark. Plato, I mean, this is not new to your generation. This has been going on for a long time. Plato Okay, the great philosopher, he said, listen, man, until we hear a still more sure word from God, this is what philosophers, philosopher, philo means love, um, you know, Sophia, wisdom, lovers of wisdom, that's where the word philosophy comes from. Lovers of wisdom have always said what Plato said, until we hear a sure more word from, a more sure word from God, we're going to be like two barks is the word he used, but it's the word that means ship. We're going to be like two ships, you know, making its way through an ocean at night in the middle of a storm. What's Shakespeare, what's, what's Plato saying there? Plato's saying, look, if you're a ship on the ocean at night in a storm, I mean, there's, there's nothing to guide you. There's no truth anchored in the heavens, right? Because if you're on the ocean at night and you're in a ship, then you're going you're gonna to look up at the stars, okay? 
and not the planets. Planets, the word planet comes from the word that literally means wanderer. Don't, don't fix your future course on what wanders, what moves, but fix your future on what is anchored and true. And you follow what's up there, but if it's a storm at night and it's dark, Plato ends his quote by saying, all we can do is trust in the best opinions of men. And he goes, that's trouble. Every philosopher, lovers of wisdom, would love a more sure word from God. You don't need insta theology when you can get real theology. When you can get, literally, God's word. That's what that means. Theos, God, logos, word, the word of God. And so what we're trying to do is just lovingly share with you so you don't have to kind of pick your way through life. I, uh, I've got lots of folks, you know, now that are kind of my generation, and we're, we're a lifetime and a half ahead of you, most of the folks that are, are dropping in on this. And I can now tell you with a little bit more experience that Insta theology, we didn't have Instagram, we didn't have any even social media, it wasn't around, but man, there were slogans that they fed us and that many of us formed our life on. Um, I've got lots of buddies that have um, succeeded in following their dreams or attaining success and, and doing things at the highest pinnacles of life. I used to walk to class with Brad Pitt. All right, he and I went to college together. We lived next to each other. And, and I, I can remember, you know, Brad kind of making his way. Cheryl Crow and I hung out in college and we were friends. We were at a concert together on a date. And I, and I, and I was sitting there and she looked at me. She just elbowed me. She goes, man, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that one day. And she did. But she did a lot of other things because following the dreams and Cheryl was gifted and, and Brad had talent. Even then, I can just tell you, I've watched a lot of their journey through life and in getting the success of their dreams and their visions, it doesn't always work out in the way that um, you think it will. I mean, this is my friend Brad. This is what he says to you. Listen to him. He says uh, in an interview with Rolling Stone, man, I know all these things are supposed to seem important. The car, the condo, our version of success. But if that's the case, why is the general feeling out there reflecting more impotence and isolation and desperation and loneliness. If you ask me, I say, toss it all. We gotta find something else. Because all I know is at this point in time, we're heading for a dead end, a numbing of the soul, a complete atrophy of the spiritual being. And I, I don't want that, he says. So the Rolling Stone magazine interviewer said this, so man, if we're heading toward this kind of existential dead end in society, if, if to follow our dreams and follow your, your, your heart's desires isn't the thing, then what's the thing, they ask him. What do you think should happen? This is Brad Pitt. Now listen, you need to know something. Brad danced with spiritual truths. He was around theology, but it never became his theology. But watch what happens when you don't learn by humbling yourself. You're gonna learn by being humbled. And so here's my humble friend. He says, hey man, I don't know. I don't know. But the emphasis now is so much on, on success and personal gain. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in it. I'm telling you, it's just not it. I'm the guy who's got everything. I know, but I'm telling you, once you've got everything, then really all you've got left is yourself. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. It doesn't help you sleep any better. And you don't wake up any better because of it. It's just a humble truth right there. I, I, you know, Michael Jordan, who's also of my generation, um, Michael Jordan was told at one time by GQ magazine that when all the guys who subscribed to that magazine, when it was at the zenith of it being a big deal, um, they, could, they, they were asked the question, if you could be anybody you know, for a year, who would it be? And all the guys that subscribed to that magazine put all their answers in, they compiled them all up, and the answer was Michael Jordan. I want to be Michael Jordan. And they went to Michael Jordan, they go, hey, bro, what do you think, what's that like to be the guy that if guys could be any guy they wanted to be for a year, that, that, um, you know, that, they, that they could be me, be you. And, and uh, Jordan said, well, that doesn't surprise me. He goes, but make them be me for five years. And you know, after a while, they're gonna find out that, that all the restaurants, all the doors opening, all the women opening to you, all the things you want, it just doesn't satisfy. Make them be me for longer and see what they want. 
You see, here's the thing. You're going to be you your entire life. And so what you got to figure out is, is there something I can follow that's a blessing to me? Let me just let you read from one of your own generation who experienced, you know, a whole lot of success early on in life. My man, Justin Bieber, right? You've heard Justin. Did you see his Insta post recently? All right, just watch this. I mean, it's a little long, but I want you to hear from the philosophers of your day. Said it's hard to get out of bed in the morning with the right attitude when you're overwhelmed with your life. You ever felt like that? This is Justin Bieber. How's he overwhelmed with his life? Well, listen. Man, your past, your job, your responsibilities, your emotions, your family, your finances and relationships. When it feels like there's trouble after trouble after trouble, you start foreseeing the day through a lens of dread. Wow. And sometimes you just, you just all you can do is anticipate another bad day, a cycle of feeling disappointment after disappointment. Sometimes it can get you to the point where you can't even want to live anymore. Can you believe that? That life where you feel like it's never going to change. He says, well, I can fully sympathize with you. I could not change my mindset. I was stuck. I was following my dreams. I was actually living your dream. I got sucked up. He's going to go on to tell you in a vortex of the world exploiting me. And I was living what you guys thought was your dream. He goes, but I'm fortunate now to have people in my life that continue to encourage me to keep me going. You see, I got money, I got clothes, I got cars, I got accolades, I got achievements, I got awards, and I was still, listen to this, 30 years before Brad, in the same interview, I still didn't have it. Because I had this Insta thing that was promising me something that doesn't give you anything. Have you noticed the statistics of child stars and the outcome of their life? There's an insane pressure and responsibility put on the child whose brain, emotions, and frontal lobes, decision-making abilities aren't developed yet. No rationality. They're defiant. They're rebellious. Things all of us have got to go through to learn. But when you add the pressure of stardom, it does something to you that is quite unexplainable. Listen, you see, I didn't grow up in a stable home. My parents were, were uh, separated when I was young with no money, still young and rebellious as well. Because why? Because my dad's passion wasn't to stay committed to my mom. He followed his heart right away from being my dad. And there was a vulnerability and a wound there. As my talent progressed, he said, I became ultra successful. It happened within a strand of two years. My whole world was flipped on its head. I went from a 13-year-old boy from a small town to being praised left and right by the world with millions saying how much they loved me and how great I was. Isn't that your dream? I don't know about you, but humility comes with age, man. It sure does. You hear these things enough as a young boy and you actually start believing it. Rationality comes with age and so does your decision-making process. One of the reasons you can't drink until you're 21. He's just in search right there. Everyone did everything for me, so I never learned the fundamentals of responsibility. So by this point, I was 18 with no skills in the real world, with millions of dollars and access to whatever I wanted. And this can be very scary. You're like, wait a minute, boy, that's my dream. And what he's gone through to say is, don't make it your dream. I'm just going to fast forward. You can go back and find it. I think this was around Labor Day he posted this to all 119 million followers. And I hope they followed him because here's what he says in the last paragraph. He said, I started doing pretty heavy drugs at 19 and abused all of my relationships. I became resentful, disrespectful to women and angry. I became distant to everyone who loved me. I was hiding behind a shell of a person that I'd become. I felt like I could never turn it around. It's taken me years to bounce back from all these terrible decisions, fix broken relationships, change relational habits. And luckily, man, God blessed me with extraordinarily kind people who love me for me. And now I'm navigating the best season of my life. It's marriage, which is an amazing, crazy new responsibility. But watch this. It ain't easy. It takes patience and trust and commitment and kindness and humility and all the things it looks like to be a good man. Watch. All this to say, keep fighting. Jesus loves you. Now, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that that one of your contemporaries who frankly isn't chasing your, a dream, he has lived the dream. I'm just living the dream. He's saying, listen man, you gotta wake up. Because the dreams that we're chasing sometimes turn into nightmares. Some of you guys are experiencing that. And you wish you could just wake up and get out of it, but you're stuck in the same way that Justin was stuck and there's just something there that's not working out for you. And I gotta tell you, I know why. It's, it's because there's an insta theology out there that doesn't work, that you've just been sucked into. You know, I'm going to tell you another. Here's some real theology, okay? This is, this is some theology. This is God who loves you. This is the one that Justin said, listen, man, don't chase what I chased. It doesn't mean don't, don't use your talent. It doesn't mean don't believe that maybe you can go out there and get a break. He's just saying don't count 
on that break making you. Because stardom doesn't make you, God makes you, and God loves you, and he's good. And the reason your life is as hurting as his was with all that success is because it doesn't matter if you have success or no success. The question is, do you know God? Do you have good words from God that inform you? I got some good news for you, man. It's not like this a mystery. You gotta climb, you know, go rent a yak and find a Sherpa and climb up some mountain and find some mysterious cave somewhere where you can sit down with a wise man who might give you a little bit of time. This is amazing. God is more anxious to reveal to you his heart than you'll ever be to seek it. He wants to give to you as a loving father what you need and what you can follow. You you don't need a slogan, you need a savior because all of us are born into this rebellious little, I got this, I don't need you life. And and when we see that, that there's a way that seems right to us, That leads to death, we finally humble ourselves and go, hey God, could you love me still? And his answer is yes. I've demonstrated my love for you. And that while you were still a little rebellious, insta, spontaneous, self-absorbed, no theology individual, I gave my life for you so you could see a word from God. This is who his word is, he's love. And he cares for you. And he's not gonna just dismiss your sin and so, He had to figure out a way to deal with that and he dealt with it by himself becoming sin for you that you could be reconciled to him and this is what he says. I want you to remember the words of Justin and the words of Brad and now listen to the words of a guy who knew God and the wisdom that comes from God. This is in Proverbs 3. I'll just pick you up right there in the middle of the chapter and in verse 13, do you remember what they both said? It's despairing, it's depressing and I, I I can't sleep well, it's just not the key. Watch this, how blessed is the man who finds wisdom. The man, the woman, the human that gains understanding for the profit of wisdom is better than the profit of silver and her gain better than fine gold. How amazing would it have been for Brad to use all of his acting talent and known this instead of thinking that maybe his acting talent and his good looks and his fame could have gotten him peace. See, he had the chance Okay? He wasn't around anything exactly like the porch, but he was around this. But this never sunk in here, and so he had to learn, man. He had to learn by climbing mountains and realizing that in the mountain the air was thin and it chokes you and there's no life there. And I think if he was here, he'd tell you, why don't you learn, man, before you start climbing the wrong mountain? Watch this. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are are real riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and her paths are peace. See, can I just ask you this? I mean, I can tell you, by the grace of God, about your age, I mean, I I was all in with Jesus, and so life wasn't easy. I didn't get married until I was 27. It wasn't like it was just all falling right in, or 28, you know, but I, you know, some of you guys are like, well, I'm 32, Todd, and I'd say it doesn't matter. I can tell you that it can still be a pleasant way and peaceful way when you know the way you're supposed to live and who you're supposed to live with. I mean, Jesus is enough, he's sufficient, watch this. Uh, wisdom that God gives is a tree of life to all those who take hold of her, and happier all who hold fast. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps were broken up, the skies with dew. Watch this. So my son, listen, don't let, don't let them vanish from your sight. Keep sound wisdom and discretion so there'll be life to your soul and adornment to your neck. It's just It's the most beautiful thing that somebody could wear, which is to live life the way God wants you to live life. It's beautiful. It makes you beautiful. And you'll walk securely. Watch this. Your foot won't stumble. Do you remember what Brad said? Do you remember what Justin said? When you lie down, you won't be afraid. And when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Don't be afraid of sudden fear of the onslaught of the wicked when it comes? No, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. I mean, that's some theology for you. I'm just gonna tell you that that isn't just words from a guy who had also kind of done what Brad and Justin had done. 
later in his life and he came back to saying, I just wish I would have, I wrote those words and I deviated from them. I was around this truth and I didn't walk in those ways. And so the guy who wrote that wrote another book called Ecclesiastes where he lived the life of our dreams. He was a hedonist, he was wealthy, he was a womanizer. I mean, he had power, he had it all. And he said, vanity, it's all vanity. There's no life there. And he came back and he said, this is the secret of wisdom in your youth. Learn to fear God. And that doesn't mean, like, be scared of God. Learn to know how good God is, that it would just horrify you that you wouldn't let him inform your 20s. Because he makes 20s beautiful, and 30s beautiful, and 40s beautiful, and 50s beautiful. That's who our God is. Let me just give you one more thing, and I'm give you some real practical stuff tonight, too. And... and um, you know, I, I was thinking about this as a guy who is part of Gen Y. So just a reminder, Gen Y are anybody that's born between 1980 and 1994. That's, that's most of the folks that are tracking with me right now and listening. This guy is a computer science prof at Georgetown University. And, and he was just watching how a bunch of your contemporaries and your peers were struggling at work because, you know, we, we, we think that, man, if I, I'm supposed to chase my dreams and live my passion and find what I love. If I don't love my work in year one or month one, then this must not be where I'm supposed to work. And, and we're jettisoning careers and we're not satisfied because we thought work would make us happy. You know, and work is good. Work doesn't make you happy. Can I tell you so, something else? I mean, happy is good, but happy doesn't make you happy. Happy is um, what you experience when it's generally going well with you. And what I want to offer you is not insta-happy. I want to offer you blessedness. That word blessedness is the word be happy. It's, it's a deep and abiding happy. But here's the thing. The world is lying to you. And it's giving you a false theology. And it's not your fault because your society, your world, the one that my generation largely has Offered to you is a word that is jettis a world that is jettisoned the basic teachings of God who loves you. What's called the Judeo Christian ethic. Even people who don't know God but who do what God wants them to do generally do better. This is not health, wealth, and prosperity, but it is. It's going to be a better life. And part of that betterness is when trouble hits you, you're not haunted by the thought that I've brought this on myself. I, you know, the very first week of the Insta series where we kind of um, talked about the good vibes, health, wealth, and prosperity, nonsense and lie. Uh, um, I, was, I was up here, I wouldn't teach at the porch that night, but I was walking back through and some of you grabbed me and they go, man, I just wanna, I just wish I could know that it was gonna be okay. And I kind of like that offer of good vibes, health, wealth, and prosperity gospel because if I just live the way that they tell me to live, I, I, I wanna know it's gonna work out well for me. I go, but listen, it's a lie. It's a lie that if you give God a thousand, he'll return it to 10,000. It's a lie that if you have enough faith that cancer will go away or that, that, that man will come or that woman will say yes. It's a lie. It doesn't always happen. It's not a faith problem. It's just part of being in a world where sometimes things that you want to go a certain way don't go the right way. But here's the peace. You want promised peace? Here's how you can get it. You can order your life in humility before God. So in this world, still racked with trouble, when trouble comes, you're not laying in bed kicking yourself because you brought the trouble on yourself. In fact, God's even told you that in him you'll have peace, but in the world you'll have trouble. The world will offer you fleeting moments of peace, but then trouble's gonna come, and if you don't have something to explain the trouble that's here in this world, and guess why there's trouble in the world? Because our world lives according to an insta-theology. Our world lives according to lies. And when you expect lies to deliver something truly wonderful, you're going to be disappointed. And so God calls you to follow him and believe in him. And what gives you peace is that if you live your life well and things don't break out, you know that this life is not your home. You know that God's going to reward those who are faithful. And worst case scenario... You're talking about a few decades that will have you standing before the one whose opinion matters and he's going to look at you and he goes, look, I know it was hard. I know health didn't come your way. I know you spent your life in a wheelchair. I know you never um, 
were, were met with somebody who told you they loved you and cherished and nourished you, but you were satisfied in me and you showed others the sufficiency of who I am and welcome my beloved. You might go, Todd, I'm not interested in that. And I'm telling you, you ought to be because there's all kinds of folks who have that ring in their left hand who bought the lie that, man, you know, if a great relationship is 100, right? And so I'm single, that's a zero. So even a bad marriage, you know, a four is four degrees better than where I'm at. Hey, that's a lie. Being single is not a zero. You need to realize that, that if you're gonna do that, what you gotta realize is, is if being single and sufficient with God is just zero, okay, a bad relationship is a negative 100. And you don't want that pain. But it's not a zero. He's enough. And what you want is to learn to walk with him and be satisfied in him. And you find somebody else who walks with him and is satisfied with him. And who, even though they, they, they're frail and they make mistakes, when they make mistakes, they own it and they repent of it. And together, you guys are working towards the hundred, which is being home with Jesus, the only one that won't disappoint. You don't need to follow your passions, you need to follow Jesus. Here's what happened in your generation. Um, you kind of bought the lie. There's a thing called Google's Ngram Viewer. I'm gonna show you a chart in just a minute. Google's Ngram Viewer, I don't even know this existed, but Google, which is just a, a, an amazing processor of information, it tracks words and phrases that make their way into literature, into, into print, into human discourse. And what I want you to see, remember Gen Y was born in 1980, and then, you know, or through 1994, which means your formative years Okay, for, for most of you, we're early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. Okay, so watch this. This is the Google, N, um, the Google Ngram viewer for the phrase, follow your passion. Take a look at this. This phrase throughout human history was used at a very minuscule level. And then along about 1994, all the way to 2008, follow your passion, we started saying that all the time to you. Why? Because your parents worked hard and they had to get in the, you know, work a day world and now they prospered and they go, so now we want you to live your dreams. You do you. And what you're finding is that doesn't work. Do you know this? For the first time since the Spanish influenza, life expectancy in America has gone down three years in a row. We are the wealthiest and most prosperous country we have ever been, and life expectancy is decreasing. Do you know why? It's because there has been a spike in deaths of despair. There's more suicides. There's more liver disease, which we know comes from alcohol abuse, and there's more deaths from opiate overdoses. In this successful, follow your passion infused world, you don't need a slogan, you need a savior. You know why you need a savior? Here's why, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse five. This is what it says to you in that little section of scripture. It says, thus says the Lord, <laughs> Theos, God, the one who loves you and he wants to set you free and he's not looking to rip you off. This is what he says, cursed is the man who follows their dreams their passions, their heart. We say around here all the time, don't follow your heart, inform your heart. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and what seems right to man. The one who makes man and the best opinions of man his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. The people who don't lean on their own understanding and in all their ways acknowledge him, their paths aren't straight. It says, for that person will be like, and, and hasn't this been so many of your experience? Some of you guys that haven't, by the kindness of God, learned his ways. The person who trusts in mankind and follows their heart and doesn't inform their heart with God's gracious word will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes. Their sleep won't be sweet. There will be no rest. But they'll live in a, in a, a stony wasteland, in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Oh, man. But verse seven, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. You ever seen people like this? 
I mean, I mention her to you all the time because just as a guy who was an athlete and who um, delights in physical activity and competition and all that, I can remember I thought the worst thing that would ever happen to me would be if I was in a wheelchair. And, you know, about the time I was in my teenage years, I bumped into a, a gal that had just pushed through her. She was a great athlete. Her name is Johnny Erickson Tata. I just can't encourage you enough to sit at her feet. Johnny, through a freak accident in the ocean, severed her spinal cord, has been in a wheelchair now for over five decades. But she's not in a stony wasteland. It's not in a, a world filled with salt. I mean, she is a tree firmly planted by a tree of water that extends its root, as it says in verse eight, by a stream. And she doesn't fear when the heat comes. She's not wild about her wheelchair. She struggles with the same things you and I struggle with, but I'm telling you, man, that life is green and it is beautiful. And I look at her, she's not anxious about the things that we're all anxious about. There's no year of drought. There's no lack of fruit in her life like we're promised in verse eight and nine because Jesus says, listen, man, you need to know she's not following her passions and her dreams. She's not living her best life now. She is actually trusting in the only God who's ever lived. And because of that, because she's not following her deceitful heart, but she's trusting in a good and kind king. There's a beauty to her story. I can remember saying to God when I met Johnny, I just said, Lord, if you gotta put me in a wheelchair to teach me that you alone are sufficient, put me in a wheelchair, but oh Lord, please. This is a prayer I would encourage you to pray. But oh Lord, please give me enough humility that I can learn it without having to go that direction. Let me live my life in such a way that if I end up in a wheelchair, I won't think this is the only way I could have learned that lesson. But God, if you're who you say you are, take me to the wilderness quickly. Give me pain quickly. Strip me from everything I would love other than you quickly so I can learn who you are. So here's the beautiful thing. What a humble person does is a humble person looks up in their strength, right? Don't be the kind of person that the first time you look up is when you're flat on your back because you've been run over by another illicit relationship, another moment of stupidity. But in your strength, while you're young, look to your God. This is what God does. He doesn't leave you out there waiting for a slogan. He comes in the form of a savior. I'll just give you a few things. I, I, could, I could go on a list. I, I, one time I sat down with my kids and, um, you know, and, and I just, every now and then tried to give them just some simple things to do throughout their day that if they wanna follow Jesus and learn his ways, that these are some things that they can do, right? So, so if you will, these were just little, in effect, moments that I, as a, as a loving father who, who learned from my loving father, was trying to tell my young sons and daughters, look, this is some things that you can do. And when you follow Jesus and don't follow your heart, these are things that will be true of you. And this is the life. And so one of the things, and I just kind of put them together in L, you know, in L's. I just used L's. Like, get the L out of you, right? So let's just learn truth <laughs> by, by putting the right L in our life. The first thing I just told them is I just said, man, listen, the reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are, are true riches, not the riches that Brad Pitt would tell you don't satisfy, honor and life. And so just be a learner. Look, can I tell you how relevant this book is? 2,000 years ago, a brother said this, have nothing to do with insta theology, with worldly fables, fit only for old women, that people sit around and make Pinterest posts. It's in the Greek, believe me, it just trust me, it was there. <laughs> but on the other hand, then discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. I mean, it's just a fact that discipline, guys, is the price of freedom. You, you, have, to, you have to go to work and, and discipline yourself. The precious possession of a man, the scripture says, is diligence. And you gotta be diligent to learn at the foot of truth and the foot of someone wiser than you. My kids say this to me all the time. You know, I, I can remember it. And I said the same thing when I was their age, like, this is stupid. I'll never use this stuff. Why are they making me read it? Right, you ever, you ever said that? Especially when you're in high school, right? And, and you just kinda, so we can look back together because we're all beyond that. And we all said it. 
And you know what I said to him? I go, hey, listen to me, look. You know what you are gonna use? What you're gonna use is you're gonna learn that all of life isn't easy and life isn't about you. You're gonna learn to submit to authority. You're gonna learn to have an assignment and perform the assignment with excellence. You're gonna learn to discipline yourself, to not just play Xbox all night and then cram and hope you get by. But no, you're gonna do the work you're supposed to do so you can show yourself as a trustworthy individual. And that learning to be faithful and disciplined and to work when you're supposed to work and to play when you're supposed to play, it's going to lead to prosperity later in your life. So you're absolutely correct. You may never, ever use this equation. You may never use this trivial fact they're trying to teach you about Texas history, but what you're gonna use is what you're forming in your life now, which is personal integrity and responsibility and diligence. That will set you on the course of, of greatness and peace. Discipline is the price of freedom. But let me just tell you something. Freedom is the reward of discipline. Right? You're, you're free. You're not burned and shackled by addiction and depression and despair and regret. You're free from those things because you've lived your life with honor that your Father in heaven doesn't just tell you to suck it up and do it, but he even enables you to do it when you humble yourself before him. So learn his ways, I told my kids. I would ask him, what have you done today to grow in wisdom and stature? Let me just ask you, what, what did you do today? Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. What did you do today to grow a little bit more versed in true theology? I would ask him, what did you learn today about God? What one truth about God were you reminded of in his word or his purposes that you didn't know yesterday? Was there anything you did today? You might go, well, Ty, that's why I'm at the porch. Okay, so Tuesday's covered. I'm glad you're here. But what are you gonna do tomorrow? Not wait till next Tuesday. That's a bad program. Every day you want to learn more of this God who has your best interests in mind. And then I always would tell him, hey, what are you going to do differently today because of what you learned? Okay, that's what I want to ask you tonight. I mean, it's great that you're going to learn some facts about God and some places you can go in Proverbs 3, 13, you know, down through roughly the end of the chapter. But if you're not going to learn his ways and do something with it and say, yeah, I'm going to seek God more than I am riches then it, it doesn't really help you. What are you gonna do with this guy that you've heard isn't trying to rip you off, he's trying to set you free. He's not trying to get you to do good work so you can turn in a resume. He's trying to show you that he's the good God that wants to provide for you the life you've wanted. What have you learned today? Secondly, how have you led? Right, I mean, I just would ask my kid, how is this world or others better today because you've stepped up? And if you follow Jesus, by the way, you're gonna be a learner. Jesus calls us to be his disciples. The word disciple literally means learner. And so don't follow your heart, follow Jesus. Jesus says this, follow me. It's one of his most off-spoken words. Follow me, be a disciple, learn my ways, and it will be pleasant to you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Man, are you heavy, are you burdened? I mean, are you burdened? And lacking peace, it's probably because your program, your dreams, your heart, you're not informing it, you're following it, and you're laying in bed, I'm about to be exposed, I might be pregnant. I might not get a date. I might not make enough money. You know, you'll never have to say, God might not love me enough. Man, don't put that on him, listen to what he's saying. Let somebody explain to you how much he really does love you. So follow Jesus. When you follow Jesus, you're gonna be a leader of men. You're gonna be a leader of women. You're, you're gonna learn that great leaders are great servants. And so I just asked my kid, I mean, have you been a servant today? When you showed up, how was, how was evil restrained because you were there? Right? How was some girl not exploited because you were at that party and when you saw her start to drink so much and you saw the predators, you go, uh-uh, no, not on my watch. Not this girl, not tonight. How was injustice conquered? How was love multiplied because you were there? How were captives rescued? How was joy increased? Let me ask you a question. Wouldn't it be awesome if when you were at the party, women go, I'm gonna be safe tonight. It's not a license for them to be foolish and, and, and drunk because you'll drive them home, but there's a guy here that isn't gonna look to exploit me. 
Wouldn't it be awesome if, if your friends who you know, would just go, hey man, you know what, you make everything we do better. Not more riotous fun, maybe. But man, you know what, I never, I never have regrets the morning after I'm hanging out with you. Proverbs 29, two says, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. I've got a friend, Lee Strobel, who used to be the legal editor for the Chicago Tribune. He's written a bunch of books called like The Case for Christ, The Case for Easter, The Case uh, for Creation, and he's just a brilliant legal mind who was an atheist. And while he was working for the Chicago Tribune, um, he was an alcoholic, he was a rager. Uh, his wife actually had, had come to faith, but Lee hadn't yet. And he said, I used to come home and my little girl would be sitting there on the floor of the living room when I would come home and she'd be playing with her toys. And he said, I'd come home and she'd look up and she'd go, hi, daddy. And she would always gather her toys and get up and go in her room. And I used to think that she was respectful of my hard day of work, but no, she knew that peace was no longer in the home when dad walked in. And he realized people didn't rejoice when he showed up. It was like there's a predator here. That's not what a daddy wants. I, I can tell you by the kindness of God, I can remember there was a day um, that, you know, I had kind of let my kids, like, you know, we, we, we try and regulate uh, when they can just dive in on certain stuff. The young mind isn't formed. Justin Bieber endorses that. And so, um, you know, he, he, we, we just don't let him just kind of a, a, a carte blanche, you know, on video games and things like that when they were younger and um, Xbox stuff. But one day we just said, man, you can go after it, right? Just go play. So they were, they were playing for like, you know, an hour and a half and I got home because they had done well through a week and they had performed well in discipline so they had some freedom. But I can remember, I got home and I walked in the door and I can remember that I could hear them up there playing Madden and they were talking. At the time, my, my youngest was nine and he was playing with his brothers, and they were going, oh, no, I can't believe it. And, and the nine-year-old heard me. He goes, time out, time out, time out. No, stop, stop, stop. Time out, time out, time out. And they go, what, what? He goes, just time out. Hit time out. And then I heard his little feet run across the upstairs room, come down the back steps, open the door, and run to me and go, Daddy, and give me a hug. I said, I'm so glad you're home. And I just looked at him, and I realized he just left Madden. at an intense moment, just because he was so glad I was home. And I thought about my friend Lee, and I just go, man, that, that's what happens when you follow Jesus. And you're a dad that's other-centered, and you bring a blessing into the home and not a curse. And I gave him a hug, and I said, man, go win your game. And he ran up the steps. His two dumb teenage brothers just sat up there and go, you're back, all right, here we go, right? <laughs> but now those brothers have pushed through those years. You know, and they're the same way. We have an amazing relationship. You know, I just, when you follow Jesus, not your heart, and you learn his ways, man, you can lead. And, you, and when you lead, you lead in a way it's a blessing. And, and I just ask my kids, love, man, how'd you do today? Because when you follow your heart, you're, you follow lustful thoughts, right? It's desperately sick and deceitful above all else. But what have you done today to make someone else know of God's great love for them? What have you done so that somebody out there who maybe was at the end of believing that their life mattered, they know that there's a God that cares for them because you cared for them in Jesus' name. One of the things I would do with my kids a lot, you know, grocery stores or something at times, I would just, you know, let I'd see people behind me. We had more than they did sometimes. I'd say, hey, but just put their stuff, in fact, put their stuff ahead of mine, right? And they'd check it out, check it out. I'd go, hey, just bag that. And I'd just go, hey, man, there you go. You know, I can remember um, one time, we were at Target around Christmas, and I just looked at a, a, what appeared to me to be a person who didn't have the provision, you know, that we had. And I, um, I was, you know, in line. I watched the way the mom was saying, no, we can't get that. No, we can't get that. And I just said, um, hey, let them go in front of me. She said, oh, thank you so much, because she had a bunch of kids that were kind of crazy. And I go, and hey, by the way, put that back on the thing. And I let them get in front of me, and I, I let them check out, and, um, and the mom was kind of digging through her cash, and I just go, hey, this is gonna be part of ours tonight, bless you. And she looked at me and she was like, what, what are you doing? This is a great story because it was one of the most encouraging things in my life and I just said, well look, I, I pray, and I use this line a lot, I pray this small act of kindness, and it's small, just reminds you of God's great love for you. It happened to be around the Christmas season 
you know? And she goes, man, I, how can I thank you? I go, well, you know what? You don't have to do anything to thank me. I just want maybe just realize that what I'm doing is just a reminder that God loves you. He hasn't forgotten about you. I mean, that's what Christmas is all about. I mean, if you really want to do something, I would love for you to come and celebrate who my Jesus is this Christmas. Would you, would you please consider maybe just coming and hanging out with your kids and being at a Christmas Eve service? She goes, oh, I, I can't do that. And I just said to her, I go, I get it. And she goes, no, I can't do that. I would really like to. She goes, but there was somebody else who was just so kind to me. And I promised them, I promised them that I would go to church with them. And I go, <laughs> I go, that's amazing. <laughs> well, go to church. What church did she invite you to? She goes, it's a church called like water, water something, water. <laughs> kid goes, watermark. She goes, we're going to go to watermark. I go, oh, definitely. You should do that. <laughs> and I just thought to myself, how great is it? That, that I'm out there with other folks that are following Jesus and just loving it and done something to her that made her for a second realize maybe life is worth having a little bit of hope in it. Man, man, you can, do you know how, how often you can do that? Maybe this, I just say it to people all the time, may this small act of kindness just remind you of God's great love for you. Don't follow your stinking heart. Right? I mean, can you imagine a guy and he's with a girl, it's Netflix and chill time. And before he chills, he looks at her and he gets up and goes, we gotta chill. And maybe this great act of discipline can be a reminder of God's great love for you because you're his daughter and you're precious and I love you and I respect you. I'll see you tomorrow. That made me like the guy, all right? <laughs> Love. I got so many of them here, man. I'm not going to give them all. I'll just give you one more. You know what I do with my kids? One of the things I did, I'll, I'll give you two more. But one, one was just, <laughs> hey, what the L, right? Here we go. So it, <laughs> laugh. I, I just, I said to my kids, have you laughed out loud today? Have you laughed uncontrollably? Have you laughed till you cried? Have you made others laugh much today? Proverbs 17, 22 says, a joyful heart is good medicine. I mean, we're not uptight, you know, we're not pilgrims and Puritans. And by the way, before you throw them under the bus, go look at their life. Man, there was some amazing richness of life back when those people lived a good life. But a broken spirit is what dries up the bones. I mean, we got to learn to laugh. A joyful heart is good medicine. My, my family, we, we laugh together a ton. We play games. We compete. I mean, I'll tell you a quick story of just like stuff we would do like with our kids. Our kids just watch us have fun. We play games and there's consequences. I can remember one Thanksgiving, we were playing a game and the loser, my, my, my neighbors next door that we just started to build a good relationship with, they actually built a pool and it was in the fall. And so it got to November and the pool was done. So Thanksgiving weekend was the big opening of their pool in their backyard. And it's Thanksgiving night, we're playing games. And so we played a game and the loser, the consequence was, you had to go over to their house, it was almost 10 o'clock at night, and knock on the door, okay? And then when they answered, because we knew, we knew they were up, and they answered, we just said, hey, uh, whoever lost it to say, what's the pool record? Well, they just opened the pool, and that's just a stupid question anyway. What's the pool record? And then we, we just said, well, you, what do you mean the pool record? He said, listen, I used to swim in high school, and none of my kids swim in high school, none of us did, but you had to say, I used to swim in high school, and I would like to set the pool record which is just nuts, 10 o'clock on Thanksgiving night. But this guy, was, this buddy, he goes, oh, okay. And so uh, anyway, what you had to do is go out to the pool. You had to get there next to the pool and kind of do the Michael Phelps, you know, kind of thing like this. And then you had to dive in and you had to swim as absolutely poorly in, as you could, you know, like just kind of flailing your arms after three, <gasps> and just like this, touch the other side, go, <sighs> and then you just come back <laughs> and do the exact same thing. It wasn't a very big pool and get to the other side, and when you got to the other side, touch it, and just kind of go, what was my time? What was my time? And no matter what they said, you had to go, yes! And then get out and walk out of their backyard and not say a word. <laughs> that, that was the stakes. And my wife lost. <laughs> and we were all upstairs, my kids and I, we're, up, we're looking out the back window, and it was hilarious. And my wife kind of came back in the house dripping wet, like, I. I am not doing that. But we laughed when our neighbors the next day go, hey, what, what was that last night? <laughs> Besides the turkey, what else was going on over there? 
But we just, we just do that kind of crazy stuff, and we laugh about it. That's one of the favorite memories that we have as neighbors together. Silly, crazy stuff. We just laugh. We have a little, a joyful heart is good medicine. Man, who'd you bring joy to today? When, when, do you remember the last time you laughed or you cried? I, the last time I laughed or I cried was today in our staff meeting. And I, I, I don't have time to explain it to you, but it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. All right. Last one. When you follow Jesus, man, you, you, you lean on others. You don't go at it alone. And so I'd ask my kids, man, who are you relying to spur you on? You're not a lone ranger. Who, who, who are the friends in your life, because Jesus wants you, right, to not be at this alone. Wise men seek solitude. Wise men learn. Wise men sit at the feet of Jesus, but fools isolate. Fools isolate. Wise men and women will walk out of here tonight and go to open group and start to assimilate and get grafted in with other Christ followers, not heart followers. And those friends will encourage them and sharpen them and love them and shepherd them. I'd ask my kids, man, who's got access to your heart? Who's informing your heart? Are they truth tellers? Are they Christ followers? Who faithfully reproves you? Who admonishes you when you're unruly? When's the last time you repented and changed because someone who loved you told you the truth? See, Christ followers have that. I've got friends that sit with me and just go, Todd, this is an area that you can strengthen. How great is that? How great is that? Guys, you don't need a slogan, man. You need a savior. You don't need insta theology because you got real theology. Don't be around it like some people and have to learn it through experience. Drink deeply of the kindness of God. I'll just close by reading scripture. It's in Colossians 3, and I gotta tell you, this is what happens when you follow Jesus. You can really look forward to something. You don't, you don't have dread. So, so in Colossians 3, 1, it says, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, I'm just gonna quote it, which is the idea that if you are, are, are identifying with that sin is wicked and is an offense to God because he loves people and sin hurts people, you, you just, I, I, I've been crucified with Christ. In the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, so the resurrection power of Christ is at work in me. He says, if, if that's who you are, if you're a Christian, then quit following your heart, inform your heart. Your heart is desperately sick and deceitful above all else. Don't be surprised, don't beat yourself up. Temptation isn't sin. Not following the God of creation is sin. So keep seeking the things above where Christ is. He's seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above not on the things that are of the earth, the worldly fables, the insta-theology. Set your mind on God, good theology, watch this. For you have died, which means, not really, but, but you've died to yourself. I know my heart is sick. I don't wanna be in a land of salt. I wanna be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. And so watch this, this is what you've got looking forward to in verse four. When Christ, if you follow him, you can, you can look forward, there's an L for you, you can look forward to this, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed. In other words, the day is coming when the clouds will be rolled back like a scroll and your king is gonna reveal himself that this wasn't just a, a, a wisp of an idea. This is truth anchored in history. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And the world's gonna go, how did you know? How did you know he was the one we're serving? And by the way, so it worked out well for you then, it's gonna work out well for you now. And so watch this, you're not gonna fall Insta theology, and so verse five, therefore, since you know that God is there and you know he's good, you know there's gonna be a day when he's gonna wrap this thing up, consider the members of your earthly body not as worth a following. Don't just be dead to that insta pull towards immorality or that insta pull to impurity. Don't follow your passions, you're dead to it. Don't follow evil desires and greed. It amounts to idolatry. Listen to Brad Pitt, listen to Justin Bieber, listen to Jesus. Father, I thank you that you love us, and we don't have to scroll through Instagram or Pinterest hoping we find a slogan. We've got a Savior, and he is kind, and he is good, and he is right, and he is true, and he cares for us, and his name is Jesus, and we don't have to wonder if he loves us. He's shown us he loves us. We don't have to try and make it up. We just got to make up our minds, not be conformed to the world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we might get to experience, prove out with our life what is good and acceptable and perfect and life-giving. And so I just pray for my friends that tonight they'd go home having just learned to be reminded of these things and they would execute on it and they would start to be people who learn more of your ways and who lead as a result of that and who love, whose life brings laughter and joy to others, who lean on other people and who look forward to the day when you come and you come quickly and you render to men according to their deeds. Thank you, Father, that even now our deeds can lead to sweep sweet. It can lead to forgiveness if we'll just trust you. But having been forgiven, let us not follow our heart. Let us inform it. In Jesus' name.